This is a video essay about the Buster Keaton film Seven Chances, or something that occurred to me while I was watching Seven Chances, or something that I've continued thinking about since seeing the Buster Keaton film Seven Chances. Buster Keaton plays a rich character who has the opportunity to become even richer by inheriting seven million dollars as long as he gets married before his 27th birthday, which happens to be today. So we watch Buster Keaton run from woman to woman proposing, asking for their hand in marriage so that he can get married and inherit seven million dollars. The scene that really caught my attention Seven Chances starts about 20 minutes into the film and it's the appearance of the Hatchet Girl played by Rosalind Byrne. So Keaton is now running around asking everyone he sees to marry him. We're expecting him to propose to her because that's what he's been doing to everyone but he doesn't because he doesn't see her. So we enter this kind of interesting space where we, the audience, see Rosalind Byrne as the Hatchet Girl and we're kind of waiting for Keaton to notice her but he doesn't. In fact she watches him. She watches him write this note and it's almost like we've entered into her POV for a second. This supporting character who takes up 58 seconds of screen time in the entire film and suddenly we're watching her watch him and we're watching her kind of piece together what's happening here. She then has a second scene with him where he does see her but he doesn't ask her to marry him and then we have this final scene where he finally asks her to marry him but they also get this kind of tete-a-tete -tete, this kind of comedic sparring with each other also kind of fascinating because this doesn't happen with anyone else in this film so we're waiting for Keaton to see her we're watching her piece the story together we see through her eyes at one point and then she spars with Keaton. All in 58 seconds. This appearance is unlike anything else that we see in the film. Rosalind Byrne's performance as the Hatchet Girl is also kind of fascinating because it's not like all of the other actresses in the film. Rosalind Byrne is kind of underplaying it. She's got these very, these very kind of studied hand movements like that of a Hatchet Girl. So she doesn't necessarily feel like she's playing the role of a Hatchet Girl. Her hands are doing these very kind of rehearsed movements, which it feels like she's done these things a thousand times times. If you watch Seven Chances, it just doesn't feel like the rest of the film. Now remember this because we're going to come back to it much later on because what I'm talking about today is acting. What's interesting is that we all say that person's a good actor. I love the acting in that film but I don't think we have a kind of agreed definition on what good acting is and that's kind of what I would like to talk about here. But let's go back to the beginning of cinema. So in broad strokes, cinema was created in 1895 and it's created kind of simultaneously in France and America by the Lumiere brothers and by Thomas Edison and it starts its life as a kind of scientific curiosity or a tool to record the lives going on around us and then Alice Guy Blachet working at Gaumont she thinks to herself that it would be great to use the cinema camera to tell a story so she makes the Cabbage Patch Fairy in 1896 and narrative cinema is born as soon as you have narrative cinema then you need to get people in front of the camera who are going to act and those actors in the early days of cinema came from two places they came from vaudeville which is where Buster Keaton came from and they came from theatre and the early kind of decades of cinema very much feel the influence of these two things vaudeville and theatre performances are large broad you get a lot of kind of wide eyes and big gestures because theatre actors are trying to reach the people at the back of the room that's not to say that they're the only people there are the existence of those who are different Buster Keaton is one of those even though he comes from vaudeville even though he's a stage performer his performances in film are low-key natural underplayed Buster Keaton is not doing broad gestures he's not doing wide eyes there are those who are different there are those who aren't playing the kind of vaudeville theatrical cards. And something that I'd like to really get into, there are these performances that kind of enter our subconsciousness, that kind of enter our dreams. We can be as analytical as we like, but one of the impacts that films have on us is kind of difficult to articulate. It's something that kind of speaks to our subconsciousness on a level that's a little bit more visceral. First, I'm going to tell you the story of a sleepover that I had in 1985. We all know sleepovers. You get your friends around, you watch movies, you chat, you eat sweets, you go to bed at some godforsaken late hour of the night. In 1985, I invited my friends over for a sleepover. I was kind of obsessed with this Greek myth of Pandora's box and a story of the lady who had this box that had all of the evil things in the world in and hope for some reason. I saw that there was a film on that night of Pandora's box and I decided, well, that's going to be the sleepover movie. Everyone came over, we got the big TV moved into my room and we watched Pandora's box. It took a long time for me to realise that this wasn't the story I was expecting it to be. One by one, all of my friends just passed out from boredom. I stuck with it because I was convinced that that the film was about to change and become the story that I was expecting. It never did. Spoiler alert. And then kind of fascinatingly, I forgot that any of this happened for years and years and years. And then later on, like at some point in the 1990s, I kind of remembered that this was a thing that actually happened. And the space between 1985 and, and when I remembered, images from the film were kind of like they'd entered the realm of, oh, that must have been a dream. I couldn't ascribe the memories of the scenes from this film with anything that I remembered had actually happened. So 
I just kind of said, oh yeah, those are dreams that I had one day. That's what happens to us with a great performance, with great films. It kind of enters the same space as our dreams and it stops being something that we can talk about so easily. What is good acting? It's very difficult to say. When we say, what is good acting? Something that we often come to is believability or naturalness. We need to believe someone. We need to find them natural. As cinema progressed, that kind of quest for a type of acting that was believable or natural led to the creation of method acting, which has a lot of different schools. And method very much became the kind of dominant acting school for cinema. So instead of those wide eyes and big gestures from silent cinema, we're now playing to the close up and playing to the whisper. I spoke to a lot of people before doing this video and asked them, you know, what is believable acting? What is natural acting? Something that a lot of people said to me was that acting is believable when they forget that a film is being made, when they forget that there are any cameras there. That's quite tricky for me to do. I'm hyper aware of all the furniture of filmmaking. So there's kind of camera movement, camera setups, lighting, mise-en-scene, costume, makeup. There are many, many different things. It's difficult for me to forget about those and just pretend that I'm watching people just being. For example, in this moment from Death Becomes Her, it's very difficult for me to believe that Meryl Streep and Isabella Rossellini are actually looking at each other. I don't think they're looking at each other. I don't think the other one is there when they were acting their scenes. However, you come to a film like Clue, and Clue has a kind of a lack of furniture. If you like, it's very plain. A lot of comedy is like this. You see this a lot with uh, Blake Edwards. There's very little change of camera setup. There's very little camera movement. Not much furniture going on. It's kind of easy for me to watch Clue and forget that I'm watching a film and just kind of sit back and enjoy watching Tim Curry go crazy and Madeleine Kahn explode. Then you get directors like John Cassavetes, who's kind of famous for his work with actors. If you watch a Cassavetes film, there's a real noticeable lack of furniture. But something interesting about Cassavetes, one of the kind of difficult things that Cassavetes is trying to get with his performance is unpredictability because he thought human beings behaved in an unpredictable way. They wouldn't necessarily behave the way you think they would and he thought that what he called but like movie acting, which he thought was cheapening the human existence, he thought that was very predictable. But let's talk about predictability a little bit. So Lev Kuleshov, Russian filmmaker, very interested in editing. He did a number of experiments with editing. The one that he's famous for is what we call the Kuleshov effect, where he filmed a man's face and then he filmed a number of other things like a plate of food, a baby and a woman. And then he showed them to audiences and then asked the audiences what the man was feeling. And they would tell him, oh, the man is feeling hungry or the man is feeling attracted to the woman. Or there is no difference in the man's face in any of these shots. It's the audience working at what they think might be different. Jump forward a few years and you get the director Mary Harron making the film American Psycho. And in one scene in American Psycho, we have Willem Dafoe talking to Christian Bale, trying to get to the bottom of where Paul Allen has disappeared to. And Mary Harron filmed Willem Dafoe's scenes three different times. She filmed them once where Willem Dafoe has no idea that any crime has taken place. Another time where he's convinced that a crime has taken place and Christian Bale is responsible. And then a third time, which is kind of in between these two, where he's not sure. The scene plays out great. If we talk about the Kuleshov effect and this moment in American Psycho, what we learn is that audiences will work with what they're given. They will look at things and they will start to piece together the clues, which is also to say that acting is not something in isolation. It's one of the pieces of furniture of filmmaking. It's one part amongst many. Granted, we spend most of the time looking at people, but it's one tool amongst many which kind of communicates different feelings and emotions and story elements to us. Let's jump back to Louise Brooks. Louise Brooks, who appeared in the film Pandora's Box. Louise Brooks has a kind of fascinating story. She was a dancer, then she became an actress, and she kind of burned her entire career. It's very interesting. Let's think about what makes Louise Brooks such an icon. Louise Brooks was a dancer first rather than an actress, which is kind of interesting because she knows how to move around, she knows how to hold herself, she knows how to make gestures. She's also not really interested in being famous. She's not really coming from any theatrical style. She's just being her in front of the camera. At the time that Pandora's Box came out, people hated her performance. They thought it was terrible. They thought there was nothing there whatsoever. Us, in year whatever year it is right now, we look back at Pandora's Box and we find Louise Brooks to be far more natural than anyone else. We find everyone else to be kind of affected and stilted and old-fashioned. And Louise Brooks is the one that has the big impact on us. She had a big impact on lots of people. The image of her in this film has kind of infected the dreams of a large number of other filmmakers. One of these filmmakers who was influenced by the image of Louise Brooks is Jean-Luc Godard. And Godard is worth mentioning when we talk about performance because Godard has this kind of artificiality to his films. He's not trying to do naturalness. He's not trying to do believability. He's doing something else. Godard is a filmmaker who wants you to think about the furniture all the time. He wants you to think about different setups. And yet Godard achieves this kind of fascinating performance from his cast. 
If you look at a film like Two or Three Things I Know About Her, Goddard interrupts the idea of narrative. He starts telling you a story and then he stops and stops and stops over and over again as he kind of moves the entire film over to these complete bit parts who perform these kind of monologues, which are absolutely fascinating. He also kind of leans close to the microphone and starts to whisper to you. You've got a filmmaker who's interested in performance, he's interested in filmmaking, and then he starts taking part in the performance as well. So performances don't necessarily have to be natural or believable. They can be something else and they can still kind of infect us and we can still find them fascinating, even though they're not necessarily like life. If you think about Isabelle Ajani in the film Possession, Possession is a film which is turned up to 11, borders on hysterical at times. It might be what you call over the top, but it's absolutely absolutely fascinating. It is compelling. Which brings me to an idea that possibly something which is important here is the impact that certain people have on other people. So the impact that John Cassavetes had on the people around him in the room, the impact that Goddard had on people in the room, the impact that Andrzej Zalowski, the director of Possession, had on people in the room is kind of interesting. That's why you get actors giving an amazing performance with one filmmaker and then performances less for you with another filmmaker. Maybe it's because where the beauty of this performance is coming from is not necessarily just from that actor in isolation. Maybe it's coming from a relationship between the filmmaker and the actor on camera. And then of course there's the impact that those performances have on us as audience members. Going back to Louise Brooks again, the director of Pandora's Box, G.W. Pabs, George Wilhelm Pabs, he spent ages looking for the lead actor for the film Pandora's Box. He had this huge open casting session in Germany, auditions from about 2,000 different women. And then where did Pabs find Louise Brooks? He found himself sitting in the dark one day watching a film called A Girl in Every Port and he saw this scene and then Pabs decides this is the girl. You might think it's not possible for someone to catch a brief glimpse of someone and then change everything but let's talk a little bit about Raymond Rohauer. So Raymond was a film historian, film archivist, also a little bit of a shark. He met Buster Keaton in 1954 at a screening for The General and he kind of placed himself into Keaton's life and he becomes the person who has the responsibility for going around finding all of the Keaton films, collecting them, serving them, keeping them for future generations. He was really just trying to make money. He sets up this relationship with Keaton where he's going around collecting all the films and he is very mercenary about things until he gets to the 1925 film Seven Chances. He could not believe the naturalness and believability of the performance of Rosalind Byrne as the Hatchet Girl and he asked all of his staff to just kind of drop everything they were doing, go through the archives and find who this actress was because back in 1950 whenever he found his copy of Seven Chances nobody knew Rosalind Byrne's name. She wasn't credited in the film. So Raymond says to his staff, find out who the hat check girl is. Find the actress who played this hat check girl. We need to get in touch with her. But despite years of looking, years of going through the archives, he never found her. He never learned her name. Raymond, if only my voice could reach you, I could tell you her name was Rosalind Byrne. You would have seen her in The Freshman. You would have seen her in The Wizard of Oz. If you'd look carefully, you would have seen her standing in the background between San Laurel and Oliver Hardy in the film Double Whoopi. If you'd had careful eyes, you would have seen her sitting at the centre of the scene in a party in the film Flaming Youth. If you'd watched the Harry Langdon film Long Pants, you might have recognised her dancing onto the stage with a number of other women. If you'd seen the film Wine of Youth, you may have seen her in the foreground of a party scene and if you'd continued watching the film you would have been rewarded with a close-up of her. If you'd seen the sound movie Children of Pleasure you may have thought you saw the back of her head dancing off camera. No way to prove whether this wasn't her but if you waited you would have discovered that it is her. You missed her. So yeah, that's what I learned from the Buster Keaton film Seven Chances. This kind of ongoing conversation about why a performance kind of gets under your skin or why some people stand out and other people don't. And for me, I've kind of come to the conclusion that the less furniture there is in a film, the more the performance kind of comes to shine. But then I'm also happy with this kind of level of artifice. And I would encourage you to kind of keep your eyes out for scenes in films which get you thinking about what it is that you find fascinating about a performance, what it is that makes a performance work for you. You know, have a think sometime about why is it that you love the things that you love? Why do you dream the things that you dream? It's kind of difficult to talk about why things or how things creep into our subconsciousness and how they kind of like inspire us or how they kind of speak to us. There's a film out there right now with a scene in it made just for you. It'll speak to your own sensibilities. You watch it, there'll be a domino effect. Thing will knock into thing, will knock into thing and you'll be moved on to this other place. We'll have a kind of insight about what good acting means to you. So, you know, get out there, find it, find it.